from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Guy Lamolinar from the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress here. And we're the division of the library, for those of you who don't know, who promote books and reading. And one of the things we do is organize the author's program for the National Book Festival. And I should just tell you that we have an affiliated center in every state in the United States, plus in the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And you can also find us online at read.gov. And we have a Books and Beyond book club on Facebook where we invite you to come and to have discussions with other book lovers about books that we have featured here and other books. One thing I need to ask you to do is please turn off all your electronic devices. And I need to tell you that this is being brought, uh, recorded for a webcast. So if you should ask a question at the end, you will likely become a part of the webcast. It's now my pleasure to introduce Georgette Dorn, who heads the division that is co-sponsoring this event with us, the European Division, where our author did his research for his book. And Georgette is a Library of Congress veteran who also is a longtime head of our Hispanic division here. So I want to thank Georgette and all her people for bringing this wonderful book to our attention today. And please welcome Georgette Dorn. It is indeed a pleasure to wear my second hat, which is being the head of the European Division. It is truly a marvelous division. And we have readers like Professor King, who's used the collection for his book. Uh, Professor King will discuss his latest books, Odessa, Genius and Death in a City of Dreams. He earned his doctorate at Oxford in 1995. He used his knowledge of Russian and Romanian to research and write a dissertation on Moldova, which became a highly regarded book published by Stanford University. His five books, all critically acclaimed, have focused on regions near the Black Sea and include highly praised Oxford publication on the history of the Black Sea itself. Charles King is Professor of International Affairs at, George, at uh, Georgetown University. He lectures widely on international affairs, social violence, and ethnic politics, and has worked with major broadcast media such as CNN and um, at CB, uh, BBC. His newest book, which has already been favorably re reviewed, on both sides of the Atlantic is the result of research in archives, libraries, and the streets of Odessa itself. It traces the dynamic and troubling history of Odessa's Russian, Jewish, and other communities, and has been noted that Professor King has weaved separate strands into a whole that superbly describes the history and culture of this fascinating city. Thank you. Thanks very much, Georgette. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me OK at this level? OK, thanks. Um, I want to begin by thanking the um, European Division and the Center for the Book for, for sponsoring this talk. It's a real honor to be here in the Pickford Theater and to be at the Library of Congress. I have a great affection for this place, not only because it's a place where I do a lot of, uh, a lot of my work. In fact, most of my previous books were written actually written under the statue of Herodotus in the main reading room. And um, given my interest in the Black Sea, that always struck me as a particularly appropriate place um, to write in the shadow of the great historian of the Black Sea, among, among other things. And, it's, uh, and, and I feel like I've been connected over the last several years to the library in very personal ways. Um, I got locked out during the earthquake in the main reading room, and my computer and notes spent the night there. Uh, I got a crick in my neck from the Cooper's Hawk, uh, which was stuck in the main reading room, you may, you may remember, and spent, probably wasted far too much time kind of just looking up at the magnificent uh, dome and the Cooper's Hawk flying, uh, flying around it. So I feel like I'm, I'm very connected to the place. It's also uh, the case that the library was critical to, to researching this particular book that I'm going to talk about today. And, and I made a, made a list of the reading rooms that, uh, that I visited uh, and did research in and writing about Odessa. And let me just read that to you quickly. Main reading room, newspaper and current periodicals, science and technology, Africa, Middle East, European geography and map, manuscripts, motion picture and television, performing arts, prints and photographs, and rare book and special collections. So I think I hit just about all of them. Um, I'll even count the Hispanic because I had to walk through there to get to the European. So um, 
So all of them, I think, were, were critical to writing this, this book. So what is the book itself uh, about? Well, in a sentence, it's the story of um, how one of Europe's great Jewish cities uh, stopped being one of Europe's great Jewish cities. Uh, it's about how cities transform themselves, about how cities get changed, either because of things they do themselves or things that happen to them. It's also, though, a book about the resilience of place, um, about um, how cities have a tendency to reproduce themselves uh, over time, uh, how uh, cities have new lives to them, even after they transform themselves in their old place, how they have legs uh, and move to new places and reproduce the ideas and cultures uh, and charm uh, in many ways that define them previously. Well, let me say a few words um, about, uh, about what I'll be talking about today in the next half hour or so, and I hope uh, before one o'clock then we have plenty of time for uh, for discussion as well and any questions you might have. First of all, I'll say a few words about how I came to write uh, this book. Uh, I want to talk then about a few of the stories and themes that animate it, and I'll go through a few of the, the major characters that feature in this book. Uh, and then I'll say a few words at the end about what I think is the mystery story at the heart of the book, because even though this is a kind of history of the city told through the lives of some of the geniuses and villains that animated Odessa's cultural and historical life over, over the ages, it's in some ways also a mystery story. And the mystery is this, how a city that had been known for its cosmopolitanism, had defined in many ways what uh, European cosmopolitanism meant in the 19th and early 20th centuries, how that place learned how to devour itself over the course of the 20th century. How did cosmopolitanism as an idea and as a practice in Odessa turn out to be so fragile, actually, during the Second World War? How did this city learn to remake itself in tragic and awful and violent ways for 907 days during the Second World War when it was occupied uh, by one of the Axis powers, and I'll come back to that later on in the talk. Uh, when I first started writing this book, I'd written some sort of academic histories uh, before that per perhaps some of them had made the sort of crossover to not quite academic histories and, and read by a few uh, general readers as well, but I wanted to write this book in a much more accessible way, to research it with all the verve that I had researched the others, but to write it in a way that would be uh, accessible to appealing to people beyond professional historians and area studies specialists. And my wife said the key to that is to let the subject get to you in a way. And she was absolutely right that uh, the more you can let a, a subject of a book touch you in a, in a, in a kind of emotional way, I think the more you'll, you'll make that connection to the readers, she said to me. And she was right. And the way it got to me, or the place it got to me, was perhaps rather unusual. It was this place which is a building in Odessa on the corner of Pushkin and Zhukovsky streets. Uh, you would, if you're taking a little tour of the center of the city, it may be on your itinerary, but it probably won't be on your itinerary. You would just walk by it without really noticing it. It's a kind of gray-blue uh, neo-Gothic building from the mid-late 19th century, uh, falling down in many ways, a kind of overgrown garden around it, a gigantic crack that goes from the foundation to the uh, roof line. It is today uh, the state archive of the Odessa region. So for any historian who is working on uh, history of Odessa, uh, this is the place you would go and spend lots of time. And I spent lots of time in this uh, building in the um, unair conditioned reading room where the windows don't open in the middle of July. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, I feel like I actually did sweat bullets for this, uh, for this book. The staff who work there are magnificent and uh, against all odds and with very little in the way of budgetary support managed to save the written history of this city uh, from destruction. They, on a, on a much smaller scale, perhaps have the same kind of mission that the Library of Congress has. Uh, before it was the State Archive of the Odessa region, it was called the Rosa Luxemburg Workers Club. It was a building that was gutted and used as a place where you could go and do your calisthenics and help to create the new Soviet man and woman from the 1920s uh, forward. Before it was the Rosa Luxemburg Workers Club, however, it was this thing. 
It was called the Brodsky Synagogue. It was one of the most important synagogues, not only in the Russian Empire, but I would say in all of Europe. It was a great choral synagogue, and the cantor there, a man by the name of Nissan Blumenthal from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was literally world famous at the time. And uh, you can uh, go into uh, many synagogues around the world now and hear uh, songs and harmonies that were created by Nissan Blumenthal and, and first sung in the Brodsky Synagogue in Odessa. Uh, it was uh, the, the place where you could be progressive uh, as a Jew, where you could be modern as a Jew, where you could be uh, worldly and connected to the rest of Europe as a Jew in the Russian Empire, even though the city of Odessa and the Brodsky Synagogue were located right in the middle of the place where Jews in the Russian Empire were restricted to living, that is, the Pale of Settlement. But this was not a sort of synagogue in a small shtetl in the Pale of Settle uh, Settlement. This was the Brodsky Synagogue in the most dynamic city uh, at the uh, confluence of the Black Sea and the Russian Empire, one of the most important and cosmopolitan cities in the entire region. And it struck me as I was uh, working there in this building that if you want to know something about the early foundation of Odessa, its Italian and Greek uh, predecessors, the French administrators who ruled the city in the early 19th century, if you want to know something about its Soviet past, its Russian past, its Ukrainian and Yiddish past, if you want to know something about the denunciation letters, that average Odessans sent in to the occupation authorities in the 1940s denouncing their neighbors who happened to be Jewish and telling the occupation authorities where they lived. If you want to see all of that, the place you go is the Brodsky Synagogue. And that struck me as one of the dark ironies of this city, that if you want to know what happened to the Jewish community that formed a third of the total population in 1941, but that after the uh, end of the Second World War formed no more than 12% at its height. If you want to know what happened to those people and the culture that they took with them when it was destroyed or when they left, uh, the place you go is to this old synagogue. And that got to me um, in a way. And so I think the inspiration for the book is, 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 is in some ways this building. Let me say a few words about some of the stories and themes that, that animate the book and weave through the book. This is very much a character-driven uh, book, and so you're introduced to some of the key characters in the history uh, of the city, and let me talk a little bit about, um, about them. I should say, first of all, though, that Odessa um, grabs up famous people, uh, like an overeager camp counselor uh, at a Jewish summer camp, or um, you know, sort of defi defining all of the sort of great athletes uh, who might happen to be Odessan, or the great singers, and the great artists, and the great violinists, and the great actors who happen to be uh, be Odessan. Um, some of them were, some of them weren't. Uh, some of the people who claimed to be Odessan weren't. Uh, some of the people who were always thought to be Odessan weren't. Uh, but I'm going to talk uh, to you about some of the people now who actually were, uh, either by birth or by adoption. Uh, Odessa gobbles up uh, the famous and makes them uh, her own uh, in, in a way. Let me start with the, uh, with the person who is the truest founding father of this city. And it's important to remember that Odessa as a city uh, is very young. It was founded in 1794, so it's actually uh, younger than Washington, D.C. If we think of Washington as a quintessentially new world young city, uh, Odessa uh, for youth beats us uh, here. Uh, and if you uh, dig down into Odessa's past, I mean literally dig down into the city, hoping to find some ancient Greek ruins that will demonstrate that the city was inhabited from time immemorial and that Greeks and Italians and uh, others who went around the Black Sea from the 5th century BC forward happened to uh, lay the foundations of the modern city, you will be disappointed. Uh, because unlike most of the other uh, cities around the Black Sea, either on the sea itself or, or around it, uh, Sevastopol or, or Istanbul or Trabzon or Sinop or Varna or Constanza, uh, Odessa can't really boast of those ancient Greek um, uh, ruins and that ancient heritage. It is a quintessentially new city in a very old part of the world, and that's part of its heritage, and it's part of the way in which people who came to Odessa came there precisely because it was a place where you could invent yourself 
in the way that the city had invented itself at the end of the 18th century. This founding father is named Jose de Ribas. And uh, given the fact that uh, we've been speaking about the Hispanic reading room, this is perhaps particularly appropriate that he's the founding father of Odessa because, as his name indicates, he wasn't Russian or Ukrainian or Jewish at all. Um, he was Neapolitan, uh, the product of a mixed Spanish and Irish uh, marriage. He uh, came to prominence in the 1780s uh, because he, like lots of people who were looking for something to do in the 1770s and 1780s and had some military training and some aristocratic heritage, looked to the east, to the Russia of Catherine the Great, as a place where they could find adventure, do something for the service of Christendom uh, as she was waging wars against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and he traveled from, uh, from what would become Italy uh, to, uh, to the shores of the Black Sea, joined up with Russian fighting forces in the uh, Russian wars uh, against the Ottomans, uh, particularly in the late 1780s, uh, and ended up uh, becoming an officer in Catherine's Navy, the adjutant, in fact, to another soldier of fortune who had also made his way to the East and will be more familiar to you, perhaps, a person named John Paul Jones. Uh, the founder of the American Navy, whose uh, tomb you can see if you travel not too far from here to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, and whose papers, incidentally, are here at the Library of Congress, and which I used for, for this book. De Ribas was the assistant to adjutant liaison between Jones and uh, a rather more uh, famous uh, Russian soldier, who actually was Russian, named Grigor Grigory Potemkin, or Potemkin, we, we might know him as, the uh, favorite of, lover of Catherine the Great, the effective co-ruler, in fact, of the, of the empire for a good part of the Catherinean period. Well, de Ribas uh, proved to be a very good uh, adjutant. Uh, he was actually much better than Jones as a fighting man. As you may, may recall, Jones left Russian service after a sex scandal. Uh, and was booted out of, uh, of Russia in disgrace, died in penury in Paris, and we don't often talk about that when we uh, talk about uh, the, um, the, uh, John Paul Jones, the great American hero, but, um, but that's what happened to him. Reba, de Ribas, on the other hand, uh, his star continued to rise. Uh, he came to the attention of Potemkin, came to the attention of Catherine the Great herself, uh, and after a series of military conflicts in which he played a leading role in the liberation of this small piece of territory on which modern Odessa sits, including the Ottoman fortress called Hajibe that was located there at the time, of no particular um, strategic significance, but uh, one of the, the minor battles in Catherine's war against the Ottomans, uh, Deribas ima eventually managed to convince Catherine that this could be the site of a city that would be the southern equivalent of St. Petersburg. If her predecessor, he told Catherine, uh, Peter the Great, had created his own invented city in the north, a city that would look out as a window on Europe, attracting Europeans to Russia and demonstrating the fruits of Russian civilization to Europe, so too Catherine could herself do the same thing in the South, looking out on that strategically important Black Sea and the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, looking out to the prize that Catherine wished she could eventually grab, which is, of course, Constantinople itself and control of the, of the Straits. She could create her own southern St. Petersburg. Um, he convinced her to finance this, to uh, begin building some uh, docks there, to begin building uh, some storehouses and a, and a garrison in the beginnings uh, of a port city, uh, which she did. And uh, it was a project that was eventually taken up in the early 19th century by uh, several of her, uh, her successors as Tsar and Emperor as well. The irony of all of this is that the, the real founder of a city that becomes quintessentially Russian, you might say, today, of course, uh, Ukrainian uh, politically, that becomes quintessentially Jewish over the 19th century was a Neapolitan soldier of fortune. But that is perhaps somehow appropriate, because for those of you who have been to Odessa or know something of Odessa, you'll know that it has a little bit of the seediness of Naples. Uh, and in fact, it revels in that seediness as well, just as Naples uh, does. And it also, perhaps more than any other city, 
around the Black Sea, more than any other city in the old Russian Empire and now in Ukraine, has a Mediterranean disposition. Uh, it's a place where people do go out uh, an hour before sunset and walk up and down the main streets, Primorsky Boulevard, Deribasovskaya Street, uh, to take the Paseo, uh, just as you'll find in Madrid and, and other cities around, around the Mediterranean. So a Neapolitan founder was somehow um, appropriate. A couple of the other characters that I'll mention uh, who inform, uh, inform the book um, are uh, these. And I put them in this triangular relationship because they were, in fact, in a triangular relationship that I'll describe in a moment. Um, the person in the uh, lower left-hand corner in that magnificent Napoleonic-era um, military uniform is uh, a Russian uh, governor uh, of the region that would come to be called New Russia. Uh, just as there was a place called New England, still is a place called New England, was a place called New France and New Spain, the Russians created their own version of colonial uh, implantation uh, called New Russia. Uh, unlike New France, New England, and New Spain, however, New Russia was actually territorially attached to the old Russia. It was simply the southern borderlands of the Russian Empire that during the Catherinean period uh, the Russians had managed to take from the Ottomans and Crimean Tatars. Essentially, the entire northern coast of the Black Sea was known as this new uh, province of New Russia at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Mikhail Vorontsov, the governor of New Russia, uh, was, uh, even though he had a Russian name and came from a distinguished Russian family, uh, actually more British than Russian, in fact. He was more comfortable in English than he was uh, in Russian, not least because he was educated at Cambridge University uh, and had spent much of his uh, early childhood with his father, who was the ambassador of the Russian Empire to the court of St. James's. So he had spent his uh, summers in English country houses and his winters in London and, and so forth. He was, however, uh, one of the most able administrators that one could have placed in this new colonial appendage uh, in southern Russia that was being developed and built, where cities were springing up uh, on the virgin steppe, where new colonists were being brought in, uh, including uh, the ancestors of my mother who were brought to this part of, of Russia as uh, German Mennonite farmers um, in the uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries to, uh, to begin to till the soil of, of, of the steppe lands. Uh, Vorontsov uh, was the person who was also responsible for really making Odessa into a modern city in the 1820s and 1830s, um, laying out the street grid, uh, improving the streets, uh, replacing the old wooden buildings with uh, stone buildings, and, uh, and erecting probably the most famous statue uh, in Odessa, that little statue that stands at the top of the very famous Odessa steps, the steps that lead down from the top of the, the, the heights of the city all the way down to the port. And I'll show you a photograph of those uh, in a few moments. The little statue, the diminutive statue at the top of those steps is of one of Vorontsov's predecessors, the Duc de Richelieu, um, a Frenchman who was uh, like Deribus and John Paul Jones in, uh, in the service of the Russian Tsars at the very beginning of the 19th century. Vronsov had another asset, uh, however, and that asset was his wife, um, named uh, Elisaveta Vronsova, or as she was known to most people at the time, Lise Vronsova. She was uh, beautiful, or in her day, she might have been called handsome rather than beautiful, uh, coquettish, uh, from a, a family of Polish nobles, the Branitsky family. Uh, she had a, a doting mother who was very concerned that she was unmarried at the very old age of 28. Uh, and when this dashing uh, count, uh, Vorontsov, made her acquaintance in Paris, Vorontsov was in Paris because, incidentally, he was, uh, at, at the end of the Napoleonic period, in charge of the Russian occupation of Paris, and so was in, uh, in a very prominent position uh, her doting mother knew that she had a good deal uh, uh, in, in, in her hands and married off uh, Lise Vorontsova to the Count. And by all, all accounts, the two of them uh, were very happy uh, as, as a married uh, couple. Uh, she was known once they set up shop in Odessa, he to become governor, she to become the wife of the governor. She was known uh, as a supremely talented uh, hostess, uh, throwing parties that were well known throughout the empire and being the right-hand person uh, to uh, 
her very busy husband as, uh, as governor. It was probably at one of these parties that she met the person in the lower right, um, an exiled poet. Uh, New Russia was blooming at this stage, but it was still a frontier. It was a place where if you happened to uh, run afoul of the authorities in St. Petersburg, uh, you might be sent out to the frontier, exiled to the frontier, until you could figure out how to behave um, better. Uh, this particular poet, you'll of course recognize, that by the way is an image from the Prince of Photographs Division, thank you very much, uh, is of, is of uh, the Russian national poet, the person who is now known as the Russian national uh, poet Alexander Pushkin. Uh, Pushkin spent uh, 1823 and 1824 in Odessa itself. He had asked to be uh, moved to the major city in New Russia. If he was going to spend uh, years in exile, he might as well do it in some style, and he was allowed to come and work, in fact, for Vorontsov. His uh, official job was to uh, manage or oversee the colonization of the, of the New Russian frontier with German, Russian, Serbian, other settlers who were brought into, into the region. Of course, Pushkin never wrote a single report and never supervised a single aspect of the colonization, but that was his offic official uh, job. It was at one of these parties that he met Liz Vorontsova. It was at one of these parties that he immediately fell in love with her. As you know from uh, reading Pushkin uh, or reading about him, he fell in love with lots of women over the course of his very storied career. Um, and he became uh, very quickly in 1823 and 1824 the actual lover of Lise uh, Vorontsova. You might think this was a bad idea, uh, having an affair with your boss's wife. That's what Pushkin was essentially doing. And it was a bad idea, but it wasn't unheard of, uh, especially at this uh, period in European history and at this, in, in this kind of city on the far-flung frontier, everyone was having an affair with everyone else if you were part of this particular class of Russian society. And these affairs were very, very well known. Um, Count Vorontsov himself had, was prodigious uh, in the way that he moved through uh, Odessan provincial society. The problem for Pushkin and for Lise is that Pushkin was a tattler. Uh, he liked to talk uh, about things, and particularly he liked to make fun of Count Vorontsov himself, the man who, whom he was cuckolding. That was his great flaw, not uh, the love affair with, uh, with Lise. And you may know some of the very famous uh, quips that Pushkin uh, made, uh, made about Vorontsov, calling him half my lord, half a shopkeeper, and a whole variety of other very, um, uh, very derogatory remarks that, uh, that were not printed anywhere in Pushkin's lifetime, but circulated around Odessa, making their way even as far as uh, St. Petersburg. Well, how do we uh, know about all of this? Well, how do we know about all of these things, be, uh, apart from the gossip that swirled around Odessa at the time? Well, because Pushkin was working on a very famous piece of what would become a very famous piece of literature at this time, his great novel in verse called Yevgeny Onegin, uh, or Eugene Onegin. Um, he was working on it in Odessa, began it while he was um, exiled in Odessa. And as you will know from both the story itself as well as from the opera, uh, Eugene Onegin, uh, the person at the center of that story is a woman who is caught between duty to her husband uh, and an old flame who suddenly comes back on the scene. Uh, and as you will recall, the thing that she chooses eventually is uh, to uh, duty to her husband over uh, the prospect of love for uh, this rather dashing former lover who comes back into her life. Well, a similar thing happened with Pushkin because as, the, as Vorontsov becomes aware of the affair, as he is shamed by the quips that Pushkin is making publicly about Vorontsov, and perhaps even more dangerously, for this frontier city, as Pushkin begins to give hints that he's connected with liberal revolutionaries who are now engaged in a revolution uh, in Greece, who are uh, soon to be uh, making revolutions elsewhere in southeastern Europe, uh, Pushkin is eventually exiled again uh, out of Odessa and sent, uh, sent uh, to another part of the, of the empire. This is, in fact, uh, largely at Vorontsov's instigation. He begins instantly by, in a very funny way, he's, he tries to punish Pushkin by saying, 
the thing that I really want you to do is go make a report on locust infestation in the Odessa uh, region. And this absolutely destroys Pushkin. He says, one, how can I possibly go out to the countryside and count locusts? And two, I've never written a single government report. What makes you think I can write a report about locust infestation uh, now? And in fact, it's that his refusal to, um, to go on that mission and write the report that is eventually the proximate cause for his being uh, accused of insubordination and then sent on to another form of exile. That form of exile, incidentally, is being sent to his mother's farm, uh, where he can be invigilated perhaps uh, even better than in Odessa itself. But we know about all of this then from that ca character of Tatyana Larina in uh, Yevgeny Onegin, who is very clearly um, uh, connected with the, the, the real-life person of Lise Voronsova. If the character and structure of Yevgeny Onegin didn't convince you, though, you can look at the manuscript of Yevgeny Onegin, which has uh, a whole series of doodles in the margins. P uh, Pushkin was a great doodler when he was writing, and there are a number of doodles that are unmistakably uh, Lise Varonsova, looking very much, in fact, like she looks in this contemporary portrait here. Such was the frontier at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, a couple of other characters I will mention are, um, are these. And I like this photograph in particular because it uh, captures together two of the most important makers of Odessa uh, in the 20th century, people who are responsible more than anyone else for how we think of Odessa as a place today. The person on the left is, of course, the great Russian Jewish writer Isaac Babel. Uh, probably the most famous 20th century writer from Odessa who crafted a series of stories called the Odessa Tales all about the uh, neighborhood in which he grew up. He was a real Odessan, uh, born there uh, after all, and grew up in uh, a place called Moldavanka, which is a neighborhood just not far from the city center that uh, there was not the Jewish neighborhood. There was never a Jewish neighborhood in Odessa. Jews lived wherever they could afford to live in the city, but it was uh, the rather poorer Jewish neighborhood where, where his, 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 uh, his family lived. The person on the right is the filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein, uh, who was not from Odessa, was not Odessan, but was in some ways Odessan by adoption because his most famous contribution to all of this was, uh, was a film that you will be familiar with called Battleship Potemkin or Battleship Potemkin, uh, created in 1925. Uh, the, probably the most famous filmic representation of Odessa itself. And by the way, there is a new just released last year uh, what we might call a director's cut of Battleship Potemkin, which I would highly recommend to you because I'd seen the m film many times before in many different cuts, but this one really is spectacular and gives you a real sense of Eisenstein's genius as a, as a, a filmmaker. Uh, the film itself, Battleship Potemkin, is, uh, as you know, the story of the Russian Revolution of 1905. And when anyone looks at Eisenstein's work, whether it's Battleship Potemkin or his film October, um, we often think that we're looking at documentary footage. And if you watch the History Channel, although you're too, far too sophisticated to watch the History Channel, but if you watch the History Channel, um, and there happens to be a program about, say, the Russian Revolution or Rus uh, revolutions of the 20th century, they will often show scenes from Eisenstein's films sort of to make you think that there were, I suppose, uh, cameras around filming the Bolshevik Revolution sort of as it, as it happened. But he was magnificent at creating images that both Soviets themselves and us today, uh, uh, we today think of as quintessentially representative of that period. Well, he was commissioned in 1925 to create a film that would celebrate the 20th anniversary of the 1905 uh, revolution. And Eisenstein's genius, in a way, was not to set his film about 1905 in uh, St. Petersburg, which we really think of as sort of the centerpiece of the 1905 uh, rising, eventually crushed, but, but that would create the kind of toxin for the rise of uh, the revolutionary movement in, in Russia later on, culminating, of course, in the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution of late 1917. Eisenstein chose instead to 
to set his film on the periphery in Odessa and to make the centerpiece of his film the uprising or the, uh, the mutiny on board an armored battleship uh, called the Potemkin. Uh, named, of course, for Grigory Potemkin, the, uh, the associate of Catherine the Great and Jose de Ribas and John Paul Jones and so forth from the, the 18th century. You may recall the storyline in the film. Uh, the sailors on board the ship are hungry. Uh, they're told to eat rancid meat uh, by their officers. They refuse to eat the rancid meat. Uh, those who refuse are going to be shot uh, by the Marines on board the ship. Uh, and just before they're to be taken in front of the firing squad, the entire ship rises up, throws the officers overboard, sails to the nearest port, which happens to be uh, Odessa, uh, take their comrade, one of their, pardon me, one of their comrades who's been killed in the fight uh, ashore for a kind of impromptu uh, burial ceremony. And as he lies in state, uh, Vakulinchuk lies the, the the sailor who's been killed lies in state on the docklands of Odessa. The people of Odessa come around and realize that they can take no more of Tsarist oppression, and they themselves begin to rise up um, against uh, their oppressors. Uh, and the film ends with the battleship Potemkin sort of sailing directly toward the camera with a little hand colored. Uh, red flag flying atop uh, the, the battleship, uh, sort of illustrating that even though this revolution may have been crushed, the revolutionary movement uh, overall will, uh, will survive. You'll be familiar with the most famous scene in Battleship Potemkin, uh, the so-called baby carriage scene. Uh, this is the uh, scene of the so-called massacre on the steps when the people of Odessa have come out to see the funeral of the sailor, to see this mutinous battleship that has sailed into the harbor. They're, they're clamoring around those famous uh, Odessa steps that run from the highlands uh, in the center, uh, center, of the, center of the city down to the docklands. Uh, and they're told to disperse. They refuse to disperse. And a long line of uh, soldiers starts at the top of the steps, jackbooted, uh, soldiers with their white tunics and rifles, and they march uh, down the steps one by one, firing indiscriminately into the crowd as they march. And at the bottom of the steps, mounted Cossacks come and, and kill the people who are fleeing from the soldiers marching down the steps from the, from the top. The baby carriage, there's a woman out walking her baby in this carriage sort of ill-advisedly uh, in, the, in the middle of what is... Uh, uh, a revolution in 1905, and uh, she is uh, shot herself, lets go of the baby carriage at the top of the steps, and it bounces all the way down this granite cataract. Uh, you see some amazing shots from the top. Uh, you see the baby kind of lying in the baby carriage as it's uh, bouncing down the steps, and we assume in the film that the baby did not meet a good end. This is probably the most copied scene in all of film history, by the way. Um, everyone from uh, Terry Gilliam in the film Brazil to Brian De Palma in the film The Untouchables. And there are many, many, many other examples of this. In fact, someone on YouTube has put together a collection of copies of this uh, scene. Woody Allen in one of his films has a, uh, has a version uh, of it. Uh, it's the thing that made Odessa famous, because, it, at least in film history, because what Eisenstein managed to do through the vehicle of Odessa is to give a prehistory to the Bolshevik Revolution. Keep in mind, he's doing this film in 1925. He's trying to craft a way in which he can show 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, not as a coup d'etat, which is effectively what it was, but as the long end of, revo of a revolutionary wave from 12 years earlier in 1905. He crafts a way of seeing the Bolshevik past that makes October 1917 inevitable and makes the summer and fall of 1905 in Odessa the predecessor, which is a brilliant way of, uh, of, of, of achieving uh, his, his end. Well, when um, Eisenstein, Eisenstein sat down to write his memoirs, and they're, they're a real pain to read because they're written in this kind of stream of consciousness style. It's sort of as if, uh, you know, James Joyce had written uh, his memoirs in, in the way that he wrote some of his uh, novels. Um, he, 
Eisenstein reflected on what happened to the baby. And there's a very touching scene in his memoirs in which he says, you know, and he's writing them in 1946, 1947. And he says, you know, I wonder what happened to that baby who was in the carriage. Uh, I never knew his name or her name, he says. Uh, he didn't know if it was a girl or a boy baby, in fact. Um, and there's this poignant series of sentences in which he says, did that person die for the fatherland in the Second World War? Is that person lying in a mass grave somewhere, he says. Did that person have a family and grow up in Odessa, that Odessan baby who bounced down the steps? And what I find very poignant about that is, of course, all of those fates that Eisenstein himself identified could have been possible for that kid who was less than a year old in 1925 when Eisenstein was making uh, the film. Because the thing that, of course, is left out of Battleship Potemkin, and the thing that if you were living through 1905 in Odessa, you would have experienced yourself, is the single largest incident of violence, the anti-Jewish pogrom in Odessa in 1905, which doesn't feature into Eisenstein's film. There was no such thing as a massacre on the steps. Eisenstein invented it. Uh, plenty of people killed. But the largest number of people who were killed in Odessa in 1905 were actually Jews, not uh, revolutionaries. And that struck me as a sort of poignant way of thinking about what would happen to Odessa during the Second World War from 1941 to 1944, when the city was uh, besieged by and then occupied by uh, an Axis power, not Nazi Germany, but one of uh, Germany's allies, Romania. Uh, it was the largest Soviet city uh, under non-German occupation throughout the period uh, of the war. It was led during that, uh, that, that period of, uh, of occupation by the person who is uh, uh, standing behind the desk here, uh, a person by the name of Gheorghe Alexianu. The person, uh, the mural on the wall is, of course, uh, a picture of Jan Antonescu, who was the generalissimo or effective leader of Romania during the Second World War. Alexianu um, sort of, in a way, succeeded Voronsov. I mean, he was uh, the effective governor of one little slice of New Russia that the Romanians called Transnistria. It was a piece of territory occupied by Romania throughout the war. Its governor was Alexianu, who had been uh, the uh, Romanian king's regent or, or, or representative um, in, a, in, a, uh, in another part of Romania before the war and had experience with dealing with uh, uh, restive frontiers, as Transnistria ended up being for, for uh, Romania throughout the, throughout the period of the war. Um, there's another picture of Alexianu uh, just on the, on the right-hand side here, giving a salute that is not the Nazi salute, but was the Romanian or Roman salute used uh, by Romania during the, during the war. The city was, was occupied for 907 days, uh, but interestingly, very little has been written about by Odessans themselves, by Soviet historians, or indeed by Romanian historians about this, uh, about this period even though it uh, was unique in so many ways, the largest Soviet city occupied by, by non-Germans. And in fact, Odessa, after the war, became one of the first five hero cities so named by the Soviets because of how they had spent the war either fighting the occupiers or under occupation um, themselves. And one of the things I wanted to do in this book, particularly by working in the Odessa archives, was to try to tell this story. There are a lot of twists to Odessa's occupation history during the war. It was the first time in Odessa's history a Jewish ghetto was ever created. There was never such thing as a Jewish ghetto uh, in the city before the Romanians created one at the end of 1941 and 1942. The other twist is that during this period of occupation, Odessa witnesses the near total elimination of its Jewish population. Uh, Jews had uh, numbered somewhere around 200,000 people uh, in the summer of 1941 in the city, about a third of the city's total. Probably a half, half of that number, half to two-thirds of that number, actually managed to evacuate the city uh, by uh, road, by rail, by ship, uh, before the Romanians take over in October of 1941. But there are probably somewhere around 70 or 80,000 Jews left in the city when Romania takes control. Uh, 
when the Soviet Union comes back in, the Red Army comes back in, in the spring of 1944, they do a very quick census and they find 48 uh, left. Uh, that's not 48,000, that's 48 people uh, who are left as part of the, the, the Jewish community. Very few people have written about what happened to that sort of, um, uh, that remain, the remainder of the population who experienced the war um, there. Rather few people had, had, had bothered to, to ask. But what happened to them is essentially um, this, that there is a, there is a large uh, deportation effort in the fall of 1941 and 1942 uh, which is pre preceded by massacres that, uh, that take place in the city um, at remaining instigation, also at the instigation of one of the German Einsatzgruppen uh, or the mobile killing units of the, of the Reich that come through the city along with the initial period of occupation in, in, in October. Uh, it ends up being the largest instance of planned deportation or killing uh, by an Axis power um, other than Nazi Germany. What happened in, in Odessa has that status, even though we haven't spent a great deal of time thinking about it. But it's a very important part of the Second World War experience. So I tell the book, uh, in the book the story of Alexiano himself, who incidentally is executed in 1946 by the Romanian uh, communist authorities uh, after the war. Uh, is executed for crimes against humanity. Uh, you can, in fact, watch the film of that execution. It was filmed by the, along with Antonescu, the Generalissimo of Romania, it was filmed uh, by, uh, by Romanian newsreel at the, at the time. And the amazing thing to me in that film footage is that Alexianu, uh, unlike the other three people who are being executed at the same time, sort of stands ramrod straight, uh, either out of conviction or out of fear. Um, Antonescu salutes the people who are about to kill him. The others sort of squirm, and Alexiano stands uh, straight as, as a pole. The book tells the story of uh, how Alexiano got there, what he did during, uh, during the war, but it's also about the much more intimate experience of what that occupation was like, in particular about the very difficult subject of collaboration during the war. Um, it's easy to tell the story of Odessa's occupation as something that foreigners did to Odessa, but what you find in the archives if you go there is plenty of information about what Odessans did to themselves. That is, the hundreds and hundreds of letters that I found in the archives that I think no one has seen since 1945. Hundreds and hundreds of letters of average Odessans denouncing uh, their neighbors uh, to the remaining occupation uh, authorities. And they are searing reading because what you're looking into is the dark underside of a city that prized its, its cosmopolitanism, uh, that took its cosmopolitanism very seriously. But during this period of tragedy, of occupation, of war, of scarcity, learned very quickly how to devour itself. So the book ends up trying to describe how fragile social order can actually be, um, how one has to sort of work at keeping uh, an orderly and cosmopolitan society. Jews came back to Odessa after the war, but they never came back in the numbers that, would, uh, that were there before the war. Um, many of those who had spent the war outside the city were living in Central Asia, either stayed there or came back to other parts of the Soviet Union. Many of those in the 1970s and 80s eventually moved abroad. Uh, to places like Brighton Beach, for example, or Little Odessa in New York, which is actually where the book ends. Uh, Pushkin once said that in Odessa you can smell Europe, but if you go to Brighton Beach you can smell Odessa. Uh, and that is the, you know, the combination of axle grease and parsley and old cooking oil and uh, sour milk, perfume, flowers, that in incredible com combination of smells along with a fair amount of, uh, of sea air and uh, and salt water uh, that defines, I think, the, the identity of Odessa and defines the identity of Brighton Beach Avenue uh, as well. Uh, Brighton Beach is a melancholy place, but also a rather hopeful place. And it is a place where I think you can learn the major lesson of Odessa, which is this, that being neighborly, being a good neighbor, uh, takes work. It's not something that just comes naturally to all of us. Being cosmopolitan isn't a virtue. Um, it's more like a project. And at times of tragedy and, and, uh, and sadness of occupation and war, when people stop working at being cosmopolitan, uh, it can go uh, away like, uh, like dust kicked up by a sea breeze. 
Um, Odessa shows, I think, how cosmopolitanism succeeds, how it can succeed, how it can be a magnificent way of organizing ourselves and our communities, but also the tragedy that ensues when we stop working at it hard enough. I'll stop there, and I'm delighted to take your questions. How much time do we have, by the way? We've I have got about eight or nine minutes. Okay, excellent. Okay, so the deportation actions. Um, they're deported to uh, camps and ghettos that the Romanians themselves create in this band of territory called Transnistria. Um, survival rates in Transnistria were probably an order of magnitude higher than in German-occupied areas. So the Romanians, once they're deport, once Jews are deported from the city, the Romanians don't have the equivalent of German Einsatzgruppen or or you know, mobile killing units that are that are there to kill as many Jews uh, as possible. But a lo large number of people do die from from typhus or from starvation or from exposure uh, in places where they're they're sent by the Romanian authorities. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. To what extent is Odessa Ukrainian? Uh, you know, you uh, describe the, the Russian origin of the city, but to what extent? Well, I mean, Odessa is certainly Ukrainian in the sense that it's in Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a part of the, the independent country of Ukraine uh, now. And there have been efforts over the last five or ten years in particular to Ukrainianize, in a, in, a, in a small way, the sort of public space in Odessa. For example, if you go to the old Odessa city, city center, you'll find a new street signs that are in the Ukrainian language. They're made to look very old, so you think you're looking at a 19th century street sign, but it's with Ukrainian spelling, which would never have happened uh, in the 19th century. In fact, until the 1840s, most street, lines, uh, street signs in Odessa were in Italian, um, not, in, not in Russian, because it was a kind of lingua franca um, around that part of the, of the Black Sea, and a very large Italian community still, uh, still living there then. Uh, there have been other efforts to sort of, um, in fact, what has happened in, in Odessa over the last 10 years in particular is a kind of war of monuments. So there will be a pro-Russian or what's perceived as a pro-Russian monument erected, and then uh, a private society or the local city council will, will erect something that's perceived to be a pro-Ukrainian uh, monument to a Ukrainian national hero or a poet or something along those lines. And, and there were small riots when uh, a statue of Catherine the Great was uh, was put up in the city, actually restored. It was, the statue was put back to where it had been in the 19th century, but it was perceived as being an overly, by, by some local Ukrainians, perceived as being an overly pro-Russian statement to put this Russian empress and Tsarina right in the middle of the city near the Odessa steppe. The city, though, is in ethnic terms uh, majority Ukrainian now. Um, even though, uh, in, in uh, sort of in, in terms of ethnic population, even though um, many of those people are actually Russian speaking, and, and the language that you hear in public overwhelmingly is still Russian rather than Ukrainian. Yes. Uh, there was such influence of Italian artists in Eastern Europe yeah. for the 19th century. Is this, was this there in Odessa too, you know, Italian sculpture, Italian art? It was very much there in Hungary and Poland. And yeah, this, this begins to decline by the middle, middle of the 19th century, as, as, um, uh, primarily because of, of shifts in, uh, in who the main benefactors of, uh, of that kind of art would, would be. Um, Italians sort of control the grain trade at the very beginning of the 19th century. They control shipping in Odessa. But as more and more Jews begin to move to the city from the 1830s forward, um, it becomes the, the economic space, the public space of the city becomes much more uh, dominated by by the local Jewish community. And so uh, what you find is that there's a real shift in the nature of, uh, of the demographics in the city and the Italian influence begins to begins to wane. Uh, people are collecting, whether they're Jewish, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever, they're collecting artists from all around Europe and all around the world. And in fact, there's some magnificent collections, private collections in the city that remain up through the up through the Soviet period, but the Italian influence in the public space in Odessa de begins to decline already by the 1830s. Were the po programs of, of uh, Russians in Odessa during the uh, turn of the 20th century, like they were in Russia? Yes. Yeah, so you have a sort of wave of pogroms in Odessa in 1871, 1881. 
Um, and then most spectacularly, 1905, 1906, which the 1905 pog pogrom was at the time the largest, most destructive pogrom in, in Russian history, which also, you know, interestingly then doesn't make it in, into Battleship Potemkin, even though if you were living through that period, it's the thing that you would have remarked on. Um, there is a, a wonderful novel of, of Odessa from this period, recently translated a couple of years ago, called The Five. So if you're interested in the 1905-06 period, it's written by a man maybe familiar to some of you named Vladimir Jabotinsky. Uh, Jabotinsky was the founder of revisionist Zionism and is now the sort of inspiration for, for example, the Likud party in, in Israel, very famous um, a right-wing Zionist who also happened to be quite a good writer, I think, and it's recently been translated into English and is wor worth, uh, worth, worth looking at. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what kind of multinational company opens businesses right now in Odessa? Well, what kind of multinational com companies are in Odessa? You, you name it, just about um, anything you can imagine um, you, can, you can find in Odessa these days. I don't know much about you know, levels of investment or which countries or which companies are, are most represented there. But there are, you know, people doing everything from, um, from retail sales to investment in the port to shipping, um, just about anything you can imagine. In fact, if you want to go to, uh, if you want to go to Isaac Bobble's apartment, which is not open to the public, but there's a little plaque on the building uh, where, uh, where he, he lived in the Odessa city center, you have to pass under a, a Bang & Olufsen uh, uh, sign and sort of the Bang & Olufsen uh, um, music shop uh, and hi-fi shop right at the on the ground floor. So the city is really sort of transformed and is very, very European in terms of the shops and so forth represented there. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, maybe the genealogy and local history reading room at the Library of Congress. That would be, that would be one place. Um, but it's also, you know, for, for Odessa itself, there are a number of travel guides and genealogical guides, um, uh, especially if you're interested in, in Jewish heritage in, in, in Odessa, which is sort of easier um, to trace, perhaps, because there are more resources. Uh, I, when I was working in the uh, archives there, there was a, a professional gene genealogical researcher who had been, who was Polish actually, who had been hired by someone to do some research in the archives. The archives are in a very, very bad state, I have to say, uh, not because there aren't very talented people and committed people trying to keep them in a good state, but it's simply for, for budgetary reasons. So you would need to, to hire somebody, you know, in order to do that, that work for you. But the... Um, um, is, this a, is this a Jewish family history? or Well, all of the old marriage records from synagogues in Odessa are concentrated in the Odessa Regional Archives now um, because uh, all of the synagogues were, uh, were either destroyed, closed, whatever, during the Soviet and Romanian occupation periods. And, but, but so much of that stuff was actually saved in the, in the regional archives. So that's the place you would go rather than to an, to an individual synagogue archive. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, that, so how are religions represented? Um, because it's an overwhelmingly sort of Russian-speaking Ukrainian community, um, it's an overwhelmingly orthodox um, city in terms of religious practice. Um, some of the uh, major cathedrals have been, have been restored. The uh, old Spaso Priobrzezinski Cathedral, which is the main cathedral in Odessa, right in the city center, and is quite lovely. It's where, um, incidentally, the Voronsov family is buried. So you can go and visit the grave of Count Voronsov and Lise Voronsova there. Um, that was utterly destroyed, down to the foundations, by the Bolsheviks in the 1930s. And about seven, eight years ago, it was reopened and has been completely rebuilt to its 19th century, its 19th century style. Um, the old main synagogue in Odessa has also been restored. There's a kosher restaurant in the basement and very active community associated with that synagogue. Um, and the Odessan authorities are trying to uh, uh, restore the Brodsky synagogue to the Jewish community, uh, which would be a very good thing for the community. For researchers, it would be a tough situation because that would mean the archives would probably be closed for a very long time. So managing that is going to be a challenge. There's also a very, very large Jewish community center now in Odessa, which is magnificent and huge and, you know, glass and steel and absolutely gorgeous, uh, even though the Jewish community is quite small. Mm 
Great. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.